your host, Jason Miles, and this is Revolution Podcast. Happy Friday to the patrons. Happy Thursday, because you get this a day early. But I hope you guys had a great week. It's been a very, very busy week for us over here at TIR, as we've been trying to do as many episodes as possible, and I feel like everyone in (laughs) this universe is trying to do that, because Pascal and I have been on uh, other shows that have not been aired yet as well, and there's even more stuff for us to do. I think we've said this before on air. I'll say it again here now. Uh, Pascal and I are now official members of the the Real News family, and we will be producing four shows for them. And then we'll negotiate after that. And our first show is going to be an interview with Adolf Reed. The first time we. Not the first time, but the last time we interviewed Adolf, we had crazy sound issues. And since then, Adolf has written a new paper with his son, Teray. And we'll have to interrogate that, as Pascal says. So I'm excited about that. And that will be coming out soon. <laughs> Probably as you're listening to this show, I'm probably going to be doing that interview. So we're excited for that. So stay tuned. This show is a discussion with historian and professor Alfred McCoy. And I've been following Alfred McCoy's career. I mean, in lines have been following it for that long. I mean, Alfred's in his latter 60s but I first saw him probably about six or seven years ago on an interview Chris Hedges did and I thought he was an interesting interesting person you know, he wrote a book about exposing the CIA and the heroin trade some time ago so he had written this article in a, in a little uh, small online periodical that I follow called LA Progressive and it was about the January 6th coup and he was comparing it or using it as kind of an analogous to when he was in the Philippines in 86 and witnessed a coup there that was rather farcical but that led to a much more violent coup the following year and then you know in the article he has uh, kind of a breakdown about how these things don't happen overnight and sometimes when we think they're kind of foolish and silly the far right can be playing the longer game eventually get into positions of power and in requesting an interview to to go over that he's like oh but I wrote a book to govern the globe is what the book is called it's kind of a history of empires but not just empires that come and go but world orders and he predicted the American Empire will be gone by about 2050. So in 30 years. He thinks the, uh, less than 30 years, he thinks the American Empire is going to be gone. And he discusses that and he thinks China is a rising rising power. And there was definitely some things we didn't agree with when it comes to his portrayal of China. <clears throat> I think he's a little hard <laughs> on them. 
But whenever you bring up China in a show like this, in a space like this, for a lot of people on the left, China has been a beacon of hope for some reason. So they get a little testy. So you won't be able to hear it so much, but there is definitely a, a testy chat. Spicy is the young people say. If you want to be a part of that chat, Tuesday through Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, we are on YouTube.com backslash This Is Revolution Podcast. And we're also on Twitch. This Is Revolution Oakland. Twitch.tv slash This Is Revolution Oakland. And you can participate live time in the chat tell us how you really feel people are saying things that you don't like but it was a great conversation alfred was you know mildly curmudgeon -y. <laughs> He's, it's a little late for where he was in, in wisconsin he said this is how long are we gonna do an hour okay okay i'll do an hour he actually stayed longer. We engaged him so much, and the show engaged him so much that he stayed for like an hour and a half. So there's, you're actually going to get some some bonus after hours goodness in this episode. But we still went to the Patreon bonus after hours. That music means it's my time to go. This is our conversation with Alfred McCoy and I. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. And if you haven't done it already, please hit the like button so this show shows up in the algorithm. It's going to be a spicy one tonight. And if you haven't done it, please hit the subscribe button. It helps us out quite a bit. And since time is of the essence, I'm not going to waste any time bringing in my, my co-host, um, Sadly, Pascal Robert will not be with us tonight. He has some family business to tend to, but in Pascal's place, I think I have found a suitable placement. You know him as the middle management of the Death Star and your favorite servant of the Deep State. It is Deep State Cuba. Give it up. Hello, everyone. The end. It's great and to be here. Yes, someone asked if those are my riffs in the beginning. Yes, they are. That is me playing the guitar in the bass. 
things. No, yeah, you I get did not get a new camera. Uh, I just figured out how to work with my Mexican Wi-Fi. Kuba, are you ready for tonight? Man, I'm. I don't know if um, I'm comfortable with uh, being in Pascal's position because mm-hmm. that sounds like a great way to get Mal Mal. <laughs> but um, you know, I'll uh, I'll do my best to. Um, to make up the deficit. Well, you definitely added some good questions to this discussion tonight. I'm very excited to have our guest on. He actually had written an article. He's written several books, actually. Um, definitely about uh, Empire. Um, I don't know if it was his first book. We'll definitely ask him. But I know he he wrote a book um, that got him into a little bit of trouble with your with your buddies in the deep state about the uh, CIA and the heroin trade. So Alfred McCoy is definitely an OG when it comes to busting out the deep state. Um, We made a bit of an intro video. The intro videos are back. Finally had some time to do that. Before we bring in our guest to get you guys primed and ready, check this out. about real food. Well, what do you mean, real food? What, out of the dirt? That's real food, isn't it? That's right. This happens to be nature's greatest gift. To a celibate, maybe. <laughs> it wasn't good. Maybe you know something we don't. Hmm? Hey, Lil, give me a slice of that cantaloupe, huh? Hey, don't ask Lil for a slice. I'd be delighted to give you a slice of that cantaloupe. Just sit down and shut up. Sit down, sit down, sit down! And shut up and leave me alone, all of you, now, and let me eat. Hey, now, what's a big deal? I can't see the difference between that and this anyway. You don't see the difference? The difference is that I grew it. That's what the difference is. That I picked it and I fixed it. And it has a taste and it has some color. And it has a smell. And that it calls back a time when there were flowers all over the earth. And there were valleys. And there were plains of tall green grass that you could lie down in, that you could go to sleep in. And there were blue skies, and there was fresh air, and there were things growing all over the place, not just in some domed enclosures blasted some millions of miles out into space. Look at that stuff. How can you guys sit there and really say anything to me about this? Look at this crap. Look at that. Dried synthetic crap. And you've become so dependent on it that I bet you can't even live without it. In his latest book, To Govern the Globe, World Orders and Catastrophic Change, historian Alfred McCoy explains how a succession of catastrophes from the devastating Black Death of 1350 through the coming climate crisis of 2050 has produced a relentless succession of rising empires and fading world orders. During the long centuries of Iberian and British imperial rule, the quest for new forms of energy led to the development of the colonial sugar plantation as a uniquely profitable kind of commerce. In a time when issues of race and social justice have arisen with pressing urgency, the book explains how the plantation's extraordinary profitability relied on a product system that literally worked slaves to death, creating an insatiable appetite for new captives that made the African slave trade a central feature of modern capitalism for over four centuries. After surveying past centuries roiled by imperial wars, national revolutions, and the struggle for human rights, McCoy seeks to prognosticate about the future, highlighting the ways in which climate change and changing world orders will shape the life opportunities for younger generations. What does this past tell us about the future of the global order? How and why is this order changed? And what will this mean for future generations? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution.
All right. Without any further ado, let's bring in our guests, Alfred William McCoy, an American historian and educator, McCoy, currently the Fred Harvey Harrington Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He specializes in the history of the Philippines, foreign policy of the United States, European colonization of Southeast Asia, illegal drug trade, and Central Intelligence Agency covert operations. He is the Alfred McCoy. Please give it up, friend. Dr. McCoy. How are you this evening, sir? Well, fine, Jason. Thanks for having me on the show. And thanks for, uh, uh, thanks for, thanks for being here. I, was, I always get a little nervous uh, when you have guests of you know, certain calibers. Sometimes they just don't show, so I got nervous. And if you would have saw me running around like a madman, you'd be cracking up right now because I was very, very at ease when you returned. Like, oh, don't worry. I'll be there in five minutes. So, so thank you very much for uh for showing up now i want to start off i didn't even know you had a book out i had found uh an article that you had written about being in the philippines during a coup in 1986 being at the hotel bar um and and you write in that piece uh, as an eyewitness i can recall the events of january 6th in washington as if they were yesterday the crowds of angry loyalists storming the building while overwhelmed security guards gave way the slavishly loyal vice president who would the president hoped restore him to power the crush of media that seemed confused almost overwhelmed by the crowd's fury the waiter who announced that the bar had run out of drinks and would soon be closing hold it my memory's playing tricks on me again. That wasn't the U.S. Capitol in January 2021. That was the Manila Hotel in the Philippines, of July 1986. Still, the two events had enough similarities that perhaps I could be forgiven for mixing them up. Now, what is similar about 1986 in the Philippines and January 6th in Washington? Well, in both cases, you had a... A former president, Ferdinand Marcos, had been overthrown in the massive people power revolution in the Philippines in February 1986, in which a million Filipinos massed in the streets of Manila and drove him into exile in Hawaii. And then a parallel between soon-to-be ex-president Donald Trump inspiring his supporters to rally in Washington, D.C., and then to storm the U.S. Capitol. So, you know, the parallel between... As soon as, well, ex-presidents, mm -hmm. a crowd of fanatically loyal supporters, the storming of a, a symbol of national pride, the U.S. Capitol, the Manila Hotel, which is a very historic building in the Philippines, and uh, the, 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 the fervor surrounding it, the attempt to regain power. But the other thing that, that I learned from witnessing that event in the Philippines back in 1986 was that that could initially seemed sort of a joke, uh, mm. even more of a, a joke than the, you know, than the shaman with the, uh, the buffalo headdress and all the Confederate flags and all the rest of that uh, in, in the U.S. Capitol. Um, uh, but very quickly, things got very, very serious. A year later, I was back in Manila, and I found myself standing in the middle of a, an eight-lane concrete highway watching as government forces were trying to overthrow a, a, a second coup attempt by those same rebels. Because those rebels looked at that kind of joke coup at the Manila Hotel, and they realized that overthrowing a government when, you, when you're inside the military is actually rather easy. And so they made a serious attempt a year later, uh, and that wound up taking uh, the Philippine Marines to actually breach the, their own military containment the rebels burned the headquarters of the Philippine Armed Forces. And a couple of years after that, they tried again. And that time they got very close to taking the presidential palace in the Philippines. President George H.W. Bush was en route to a summit with the Soviets in Malta, flying over the, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. And he got a call that Manila was about to fall to rebels. And he ordered the U.S. Air Force to make low passes over the rebels we're about to take the presidential palace in the Philippines. 
So the, the meaning of all this is that, that even a, a seemingly absurd coup can have a profoundly corrosive impact on a democracy and produce a kind of inspiration, a, an attempt to try and try again. And uh, it, it, I think there's every sign that the Republican Party is very much committed to, to gaining power in the next presidential election by fair means and foul. They, they've learned that, that you know, extraordinary actions work. You can get away with even storming the U.S. Capitol and, and threatening the, 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 the fundamental institutions of American democracy. In other words, you can do anything and get away with it. And, and you write in your piece uh, about de Gaulle in France and the Carnation Revolution in Portugal, explaining to us, the reader, that the coup isn't just a one-time event. Uh, like you said, they, these things lay in wake for years, sometimes promoting people of this fascist faction into political power, like you write about Le Pen in, in France. Um, what do you think? You also talk about a lot of the punishments that were that were given out in the Philippines, and you and you compared them to some of the light sentences that were given out to January 6th. Um, what do you think is the proper response um, to people that 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 want to be the insurrectionist? Well, if it's a military and they rebel against the state, uh, they turn the their arsenal, their weapons of mass destruction against the state. Um, traditionally, the penalty is death by firing squad. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in for <clears throat> civilians who attempt uh, protracted prison sentences. In the case of the Philippines, uh, you know, the, uh, the in the aftermath of the coup, and there were several hundred soldiers that rebelled, and they flooded into the Miller Hotel, uh, Miller Hotel, along with Marcus's fanatical loyalist supporters. Uh, those hundreds of soldiers were sentenced to thirty push-ups. It was a part of the sort of joke atmosphere that surrounded that coup. But there, you you mentioned another aspect uh, of the January sixth coup that links it to the topic of my book, To Govern the Globe, or the topic of empire and world orders. One of the things that struck me in, in doing that, that article about the January 6th coup and its comparison with the Philippines, and it's something that I'm surprised that most people haven't remarked upon. <clears throat> in, in the modern era, almost every single power that loses an empire, it doesn't simply, you know, liquidate a property holding in a kind of rational manner, like, oh, you know, colonialism didn't quite work out, so we move on. No, um, it, it goes to the core of national identity. It is a, a body blow to the national psyche, and it reverberates profoundly, deeply inside the, the metropolitan society that's losing its empire. And so almost every modern empire that has fallen has been accompanied by a, 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 a serious attempt to, to conduct a coup and to overthrow the constitutional order that presided over the empire at the time. So let's, you know, Italy uh, in the 1920s had a coup that brought Mussolini and the fascists to power for 20 years. Uh, when France uh, lost the Indochina War and then left Algeria in defeat, uh, that prompted a serious coup that by the, the French military, they rebelled against the, the French state. Uh, they killed something like 12,000 people. There were terrorist bombings uh, and three assassination attempts on President Charles de Gaulle that came within an inch. Uh, <clears throat> and the French state finally broke that coup. Uh, Spain uh, suffered a, a protracted loss of empire that culminated in the revolt by Francisco Franco against the Spanish Republic and brought fascism into power in Spain for 40 years. Uh, uh, even the United Kingdom, a relatively stable democracy, had two abortive coup attempts after its decolonization. And uh, the, the Soviet Union, as, as it gave up its empire in Eastern Europe, suffered a serious coup that uh, attempted to overthrow Gorbachev and ultimately led to his eclipse of power and the dissolution, the final dissolution of the Soviet Union. So it, it's very, very common. Uh, after the Portugal uh, as well, uh, mm -hmm. the Carnation Revolution in Spain was a result of the trauma of Portugal's decolonization. And I think the January 6th coup 
in Washington, D.C. was a manifestation of that same crisis of, of empire for the United States because the January 6th coup of, of this year was mm -hmm. followed in August by, of course, the U.S. defeat and withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is a, a major sign of weaning U.S. global power for the U.S. loss of its position as the great global hegemon. And so as our power overseas wanes, and we suffer those kinds of, of body blows to our national psyche and pride. Now, our domestic democracy grows less stable, and events like January 6th, which in, in, America, in America seemed almost unimaginable before it happened. I mean, when you think about it, you know, we've never had anything like this since, well, since the Civil War. Uh, well, also, I mean, I think you can point out that, that it was... Uh, uh, and, and if it was a coup attempt, it was unsuccessful. And I think that many of the participants themselves didn't even imagine themselves to be participating in a coup. Um, they enter the um, capital, they take control, and they take selfies. They don't have an idea about what to do with this access that they've gained. And they end up just milling around and leaving. But I think that your point is that initial types of um, actions against the constitutional order may seem carnivalesque, may be easy to sort of dismiss precisely because of this buffoonish atmosphere and their failure. Um, but potentially, um, it, it remains to be seen whether this is the trajectory the United States is on, but um, potentially this is a uh, harbinger of more serious efforts by better prepared and more determined actors to overturn the constitutional order. So, I think most people have a sort of, if, if they think about coups at all, they may have a false idea that, that because they're often run by military who are you know, supposed to be planning their operations, there's a general assumption that, that coups are carefully planned down to the last minute. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay, I just got a notice saying that the host is muted in your mic. Okay. Anyway, so there's an assumption that, that because these are military guys and they're supposed to be you know, very precise and, and organized in their operations, that they plan everything down to the last minute. Well, actually, maybe so on the battlefield, but when they enter the political arena, with, which, in which they're, they're very unfamiliar, they, they more or less opt for like a, a symbolic action. You know, mass the troops, strike a a symbolic uh, blow, uh, and, then, and then see how things are going to play out. In other words, like, like strike at the constitutional order through one of its symbols, and then go with the flow, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of abortive coups. Uh, there are many more failed coups than there are successful ones. So one shouldn't confuse the, the kind of ad hoc plan of, of Trump, you know, uh, call the supporters to Washington, D.C., send them down the street, and then kind of see what happens. You know? um, uh, and uh, so, again, very serious consequences can come from seemingly ill-planned operations. Uh, so someone in the, in the chat asks, and thank you for the Super Chat, JB, if we're going to talk the language of coups in contact U.S., can we please discuss 2000 election and Bush v. Gore? That was a coup. Um. I'm, a, I'm actually pretty sympathetic to that um, interpretation. Um, the uh, coups don't have to be executed by military people. And if looking at 2000 in retrospect, uh, one element of the ruling elite inside the Republican Party um, mobilized its resources um, in order to use what now gets called lawfare because other people do it too and um, exploit their um, influence inside the legal system and exploit the ambiguities, the sort of institutional inefficiencies of American elections to, um, you know, decisively determine the outcome of the election um, without going through the steps as specified in um, you know, constitutional rules, whether are in the state of Florida or on the national level. Um, so 
I think, and one thing that you mentioned as well is that before you get to the coups, there's a long time coming. There's mm -hmm. a, a lot of institutional hollowing out, a weakening of norms, uh, more and more predatory behavior by elites who um, began to, uh, I'm, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but um, that's the process that I see taking place uh, in the United States, and it begins long before um, January 6th. Um, without getting into a, you know, uh, all the details, I guess I would say perhaps, I mean, no doubt the long lead up, okay, uh, all the pressures, uh, the, you know, as you put it, the elites deciding that they're going to take extra, extra systemic steps, extra legal steps in order to, to, to affect their influence, sure. But when it comes to coup-like behavior, coup-like activity, January 6th is, a, is another step. I mean, for one, the President of the United States is sending a, a mob into the U.S. Capitol. So it, it's taking place at the epicenter of power, by the, and it's being organized by the most powerful figure in American politics to overturn one of the absolute essentials of democracy. In fact, arguably the essential attribute of electoral democracy, which is the transfer of power via the ballot box. Okay? Let's attempt to short circuit that. Second thing is uh, the involvement in, in of the military. Okay, there, the U.S. military had ample resources to protect the capital, right? And that's another thing that I learned in the in, by watching that Philippine coup in 1986. That seemingly silly, almost comedic coup is that it's stilling, slowing the response of of the of the. The, the military forces, all right, for just enough time to allow these events to play out. And that's what the Trump administration was doing. Um, and when you study coups, you often look for linkages, patterns, ties, uh, sort of personal ties among uh, actors. And one of the critical uh, ties was the Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor, actually went to the White House in the, in the aftermath of the November election and recommended that Trump act extra-legally, declare martial law, use the military to seize power and keep himself in office. And on January 6th, when the, the D.C. mayor's office, the District of Columbia mayor's office, was desperately calling the Pentagon and asking for the mobilization of the National Guard, all right, one of the men on that phone call inside the Pentagon who said no was Lieutenant General Charles Flynn, who is the brother of Michael Flynn. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, and so you know what is surprising, okay, is think about all of the people being summoned, they're being subpoenaed, and all the discussions. Nobody is talking about this. Nobody's talking about it because it's very sensitive, uh, and, and it's absolutely critical. Yeah. You know? The, the, the Pentagon has admitted that, yes, Charles Flynn was on the phone call, the phone call that said no to mobilizing the Guard, the National Guard, to stop this event. Okay, so that's what I mean about, you know, all, all Charles Flynn had to do was just give the coup plotters a little bit of time to see how it rolled, to see how it played out, whether they got Pence, whether they grabbed Pence and made him, you know, declare Donald Trump the winner, you know, something, okay, something, you know, um, <clears throat> And, and I think it's uh, it, it, it's a critical failure of the congressional resolution. So uh, just to follow up on your observation in, about Charles Flynn, um, one of the things that I've sort of seen as part of the erosion of the governability and political stability order in the United States domestically is the culture of impunity around elites whether they're, you see it especially in terms of financial crimes and uh, Wall Street, like in the aftermath of 2008 financial crisis, the refusal to hold anyone accountable. Um, but do you find that that kind of has the rule of law, uh, the applicability of law to people like Charles Flynn, that we're at a point where things like 
extra using force to challenge uh, the political order uh, is now, like you said, punishable by push-ups. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, let's look at Michael Flynn. Okay, he was a former national security advisor. Uh, he was a very high-ranking general, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency in his day. He's one of our most senior military commanders. The fact that you have an ind individual who's at the apex of the national security apparatus, actually, even though retired, recommending to President Trump a declaration of martial law. Um, I, how could I put it? Uh, he should be investigated. He should probably be stripped of his pension. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's, by recommending that, he has you know, committed a very serious crime. Uh, and so that's what I mean. When, when you talk about impunity, the people that are most likely in uh, transnational, okay, in the, you know, the, the, the collapse of dictatorships around the world, and, you know, the, the justice and accounting for the excesses of dictatorships in Latin America and Africa and Europe. The, 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 the people that usually escaped were those in the, in the national security apparatus, ex-military and military, that had engaged in crimes against humanity. Very rarely prosecuted because they have, you know, very close, powerful ties within the national security establishment, which, after all, as a monopoly on the weapons of mass destruction. And so states are very low to punish those people. And those are the ones that, that get impunity in these circumstances. And, and so, you know, the Flynn's will get away with it. And, you know, shifting gears, you know, back to the book uh, to govern the globe out now on Haymarket Books, uh, you speak of not just empires that come and go, but more importantly, world orders. Um, can you define uh, what you mean when you talk about world orders? Sure. In the past 500 years, there have been 90 empires, large and small, that have come and gone. But there, there only have been three and now maybe four world orders. The Iberian, which is Spanish and Portuguese, which lasted roughly from 1500 to 1800. Then there was the British Imperial Order, which lasted from uh, 1815 to 1914, and then the Napoleonic Wars, the sort of World War I. And then since the end of World War II in 1945, the American or Washington World Order, which is the system we're living in today. And now we're seeing, as a result of all these tensions that we've been talking about, that abortive coup and uh, the like, uh, a waning of U.S. global hegemony and sometime around 2030, a fading of Washington's world order and its replacement by a decidedly illiberal world order, the Beijing global system. So what's the difference between an empire and a world order? Well, an empire, we pretty much have a clear idea. It's essentially, the uh, through formal and informal means, the exercise of control over over states and territories beyond your own borders. Okay, that's, and uh, some empires have had one state, like uh, one colony, like the Belgian Congo or the, the Netherlands East Indies, which is now called Indonesia. Uh, you know, this tiny little Holland had massive Indonesia as its colony. Okay, so, um, and so, so we know what empires are, but world orders is something that most people aren't aware of. Indeed, the literature is not aware of. Um, World orders are less coherent. They're less powerful on the surface than, than empires. But in many ways, they're much more pervasive and much more persistent. World orders govern the languages people speak, oftentimes the way they worship, um, the laws they follow, and even the games they play. So they're akin to entire civilizations. So. Uh, one of the attributes of America's global hegemony was it not only emerged from World War II as the most powerful empire that ever existed, uh, with 50% of the world's economy, a preponderance of its military power, and a, a global reach. Um, uh, but the United States also very self-consciously at the end of World War II set out to construct a new kind of international order, a world order. And it did that in Bretton Woods 
which created the international economy that we live in today, set up the exchange rates, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, promoted trade and then it created the, what is now the, the World Trade Organization. So basically it organized the, the, um, the international trade system today. And then at the UN, uh, in, at the UN conference in San Francisco in 1945, the US and 50 other sovereign states got together and created the, the international community. And undergirding both the Bretton Woods system of economic exchange and the United Nations was the ultimate American project at a world order, the rule of law. Uh, all of these international organizations, all of this trade is, is, is girded with incredibly elaborate contracts, regulations, and treaties, which are basically contracts among nations. Um, mm -hmm. It's a highly legalistic system. And uh, aside from you know, the structure of the international order, it's had two key principles. One, as manifest in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt, the former first lady, uh, essentially drafted as the first chair of the UN Human Rights Commission. Uh, so all human beings have universal human rights. Colonization, conquest, uh, subjugation on the base of, of race uh, and religion no longer allowed. Uh, and second, not only did every human being have human rights as an individual, but they and their communities, their, their national community, had the right to be members of a sovereign state that had inviolable sovereignty. And so these, that, that was the, the U.S. world order. Um, mm -hmm. And it's generally been called a, a kind of liberal world order because of those principles. And it's actually... Call it liberal democracy is what you, what you call it. Democracy isn't formally a part of it, but as you know, in, in, in the U.S. exercise of hegemony uh, has been softened by two key attributes of, of U.S. relations on a formal level. One, the idea of economic development, um, uh, helping nations progress and uplifting people from poverty, uh, and uh, and the promotion of democracy. These are the two. If I may, uh, because you're very forthright in um, admitting that the United States, as a hegemon, is constantly falling short of the liberal world order that it established. That the United States helps midwife the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but is now uh, one of the great violators of what we consider what any sane person would take uh, a fair reading of that same declaration. The, the United States has, hasn't shut down Guantanamo. The abuses of Abu Ghraib are still fresh. Um, violations, in, invasions, territorial acquisition, um, or violations of the territorial sovereignty of other states have actually been routine elements of uh, American foreign policy um, ever since the ink was dry on uh, the UN document. So um, I think that you admit to a lot of the um, a lot of the the crimes and the failures of the United States, uh, a lot of the transgressions um, against the values that it promulgated or the values that are embedded in this world order, at least formally and rhetorically. Um, so one question that I think would really interest our um, viewers is what is the distinction? What's the meaningful distinction between a hegemon like the United States, which might have authored a uh, progressive world order at one point, generations ago at this stage, but routinely violates it, shreds it without any hesitancy. And not only that, but undermines efforts by other powers to live up to um, mm -hmm. those, um, those obligations. And China, which behaves essentially the same way, just with less pretense, to observing human rights? Right. Good question. Good observation. It's something I discussed in my book, Governor the Globe, in great detail. One thing I say is that every world order operates with a duality of power and principle. At the, at the principle side, the U.S. turned its, its ideals and emerging international ideals into this, this world order. Um, and all the treaties, conventions, uh, 
the international court cases, all of that, it, it gave us real life and institutional coherence and vitality to this world order that's, that's, that is founded in these two principles, universal human rights and inviolable national sovereignty. Having established that order and, 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 and played an absolutely key role in, in, in its establishment, the United States, right from the start, as it was exercising its global power, set out to violate the same principles that it was establishing almost at the time that it was establishing those principles. Uh, so uh, let's take the CIA. Uh, the, <laughs> the United States is creating the UN in 1945. Eleanor Roosevelt is, is getting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights introduced in, in, uh, in 1948. Right in the middle there, 1947, the U.S. establishes the CIA, and it gives it the authority, the legal authority in, its char in, in the legislation that found the CIA to operate extra legally. And so how does a great global hegemon violate systematically and regularly the national sovereignty of, of other states, oftentimes very poor, weak states, uh, and, and not be seen to be shredding this international or violating this principle of inviolable sovereignty? Well, the answer is you do it covertly. And that's the whole need for the CIA. Uh, it, it, it resolved this contradiction between the principle of inviolable sovereignty and the global hegemon's need to intervene. Okay, The same thing with torture. And I've spent a lot of time, I spent 20 years of my life thinking and writing about torture, about three books. I uh, uh, spent a lot of time in uh, interviewing victims and perpetrators trying to figure out torture. And again, more than any other single violation of human rights, except probably slavery, which is formally abolished, but, but you know, in the modern world, the ultimate violation of the principles of human rights is, is, is torture. And at the same time that the United States was enshrining the, uh, the prohibition on torture and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, uh, in, the, in the Geneva Conventions, it was simultaneously developing the very sophisticated techniques of psychological torture, which throughout the, the 40 years of the Cold War it propagated among its allies worldwide. And indeed, after 9-11, you know, we didn't just outsource them to Latin American dictatorships. We had CIA operatives actually engaging and using those very sophisticated cycles. As well, no longer covertly. Yeah. Guantanamo Bay. Well, it was done covertly. I mean, uh, it is it, it, uh, in the military courts in Guantanamo up to now. Okay, until very recently, uh, you couldn't discuss those techniques. They were shrouded in national security. Uh, so, yeah, it was done covertly. Although, and, when and you know, when even today, we do on television. Know, even today, we do not know the names of any of those CIA torturers. All right, I mean, they've never been named, and they never will be named. All right, it's, and, you know, it's just you know, they, but, they, they have impunity. Cuba has to pretend like he doesn't know the names, but he knows the names. George, all right, come on, man. Um, but the um, Dick Cheney, uh, already after September 11th, um, this was it, the classic um, covert language was if you're caught doing any of this, uh, any of these illegal activities, for the United States, although we've authorized them, you will be disavowed. But one development after September 11th was that the up to the level of the presidency, um, you had American public officials defending things like Guantanamo Bay. Um, and in the case of Dick Cheney, doing it with obvious public relish. Another of the manifestations of imperial decline, not only um, these sort of shock waves that reverberate through the imperial society and produce the coups that we've described. Okay, but another thing that is, is these empires get, their, their power gets shaky and they get desperate to cling to that power overseas. One of the things that almost every empire in decline does is a recourse to torture. The French did it systematically and ruthlessly in Algeria. The British did it in Northern Ireland, but actually did it worldwide. They did it in Aden. They did it in Kenya, and they did it in, in most recently and controversially in, in Northern Ireland, 
in the early 1970s. So, uh, and, you know, uh, they, what these empires don't realize is that by engaging in what is now deemed to be the most in, inhumane of practices, they delegitimate their imperial enterprise. The French systematically engaged in torture in, in Algeria. And they, the French military, when they were picking up Algerians, they would torture them and then shoot them and dump the bodies in shallow graves in the desert outside the city of Algiers. But they also made the mistake of torturing a, a French colonial, a, a, a metropolitan French citizen, a man named only a leg, and he wrote a book about it called The Question. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, very famous intellectual that day, wrote an introduction to it, became a cause celeb in France, and it critically turned the French public against the entire Algerian enterprise and made the liberation of Algeria politically not only possible, but an imperative. And so sure. the declining empires engage in this savagery, and then it, it discredits them. And the blow to American global hegemony from the Abu Ghraib scandal, the Guantanamo scandal has been monumental. And I did, okay. just, mm -hmm. just, just, just a, a month or so ago, seven mid-ranking military officers who are serving in Guantanamo in the prosecution of the 9-11 terrorists, etc., they wrote a ringing letter that was published on the front page of the New York Times denouncing the CIA's torture techniques and saying they violated fundamentally American principles and they were a, you know, a, 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 something that had damaged the United States irreparably. And, and these are serving military officers who said that. I, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. And um, I think that um, this gets back to the question of um, what the practical implication is of replacing a delegitimated hegemon like the United States, which um, in a lot of ways has been shredding the world order that it gave rise to through its unilateralism, through things like the public use of torture. Um, what's, what's the sub substantive difference between this debased world order under uh, unapologetic, out of control, um, metropolitan hegemon, the United States, versus um, what you describe as potentially a coming Beijing-based um, hegemony? Good question. And I don't mean to be contentious, but let me, let me say that I think you, you know, you've conflated, put together two things, okay? One, the excesses that we've been discussing, the torture, uh, the CIA corporate interventions, all that, that's part of the U.S. hegemony, the power side of the equation. The principal side of the occasion, the universal human rights, the inviolable national sovereignty, okay, that's embedded in these international organizations. Um, uh, for example, we're not a member of the International Criminal Court, right? But it exists, and it's a very important uh, organization. In many ways, it's the culmination of the entire U.S. promotion of the international rule of law, which we fight been... America's opposition to it. Well, I mean, we introduced this into the into the international discussion in the 1890s, and we we've, we've been pushing it along consistently. You know, you know, backing away from it uh, mm -hmm. as we did. We're not members of the United Okay, but so what I'm saying is that this this apparatus is 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 not just American. This is the culmination of 500 years of the most painful kind of history. All right the massacres of the Amur Indians in, in the Americas, uh, the, 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 the middle passage across the Atlantic with 12 million African slaves being introduced to the Americas to fill the demographic void from the, the massacre of the Amur Indians, all right? And the, the debate, I mean, talking about duality, okay, the Spanish empire was arguably, in terms of its massacres and its practice of slavery, probably the most inhumane of all the empires and all the, and all the world orders. But simultaneously, with these great excesses, there were Spanish missionary friars who observed these great crimes, people like Bartolome de las Casas, um, 
and uh, Antonio de Montesinos and, and made at the time, you know, confronted Spanish officials with these crimes and gave the most emotional denunciations that when you read their language, you read the Advent sermon by Antonio de Montesinos in 1511 that he gave in the Dominican Now the Dominican Republic is denunciation. Those words could be articulated by the most modern and the most um, committed of human rights activists. Okay, so the the Spanish duality was great crimes, and yet the discovery of the idea of universal human rights, and that unleashed a continuous mm -hmm. debate. All right, that has gone through the centuries. Is it, is it, went to the Dutch and then the British and then us. We're the heirs to five centuries of this debate arising from these great crimes, all right? And we institutionalize that in these organizations. So it's, it's, it's apart from us. And so the question is, okay, U.S. hegemony, let me finish. U.S. hegemony is toast. We're done by 2030. We're gone. We can talk about how and why. But basically, it's over. The U.S., the power side of the U.S. equation is over. The real question is, will this liberal international order, which the United States helped create, which is the culmination of five centuries of history, will that survive? And, and, and I, 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 I don't think I, it will. I, I think that's that's a tragedy. That Beijing replaces the United States as global hegemon, yeah, you know, that's the way it goes, right? But that Beijing is going to systematically damage and degrade this liberal international order now. That's serious. And I, I agree with you, and I would like to offer um, offer a different perspective. Um, I concur that the liberal international order that you describe and the notion of international human rights and an international rule of law, um, these are valuable contributions that have made the conduct of international politics less savage. You've pointed out to the Spanish Empire as being possibly the most brutal um an inhumane episode of um imperial aggression and absolutely the depopulation of mexico of peru of large parts of um uh, south america and the brutal uh slavery and peonage uh, of the colonial system that the forced conversions um we're talking about atrocities not to mention of course the introduction of the slave trade or their role in it, um, which was, of course, pioneered by another Catholic uh, empire, the Portuguese. The, um, so they're monsters, but you point out they have, there's this um, legacy of human rights, international rule of law that um, gradually alters the way that internet, interstate, uh, international global affairs are conducted. And it reaches its highest form after World War II with the United Nations. It is midwifed by the United States, but at this point, uh, I'd say that the European powers, um, some Asian countries, some third, um, some countries in the global South, places like Uruguay, Chile, are arguably better exemplars and partners, um, better uh, models of uh, citizens within that world order. While the one on top, the, the hegemon, the current hegemon, the United States, especially under Donald Trump, but even prior to Donald Trump, we could go back to Bill Clinton, we could go back to George W. Bush, we could go back to whenever you want, um, has also been undermining and shredding that world system. Um, it was a double-sided game for a certain amount of time, but certainly by George W. Bush, the greatest threat to the international rules-based order, as some people call it in Washington, was the United States, the country that was nominally the guarantor of it. And if the American hegemony declines, then, and it's replaced by China, you still have the Chiles, you still have the EU, you still have Canada, you still have New Zealand, you still have Japan, you still have Singapore, you still have South Korea, you may not have Taiwan. Um, and you still have those international agreements and organizations that temper the conduct of uh, global affairs. And the question is, can they be durable with uh, hegemon as brutal and um, ruthless as the PRC? 
Well, I'd argue they survived the hegemon as brutal and ruthless as the United States. So I see a, an actually more optimistic outcome where um, it's possible that simply due to imperial convenience for the sake of the exercise of power by the PRC, these institutions left over, inherited from the United States, are taken up um, in a similar way to the United States in terms of their use. These are rules that you can force on other countries and use your power to temper um, you know, second, third country relations that don't concern you, while as hegemon, you um, reserve the, the right of exception you know, that you are above the laws that you enforce on others, which seems to me, you know, as, as a Canadian, something of a lateral move. Um, Could I interrupt? The situation may not be that different. Of course, please. It, it, uh, uh, I'm not interrupting, but I want to catch your point before you shift because you're kind of on a roll. Um, okay. okay. Um, so what's the difference between China as a global hegemon and the United States or Britain? Okay. Um, why is there some critical aspect of it? Okay, first of all, China is the first global hegemon to emerge in the succession from the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the English, and the United States. It didn't participate in this painful discussion, this continuous development of these ideas of human rights. I would the actually change that, but please go on. Okay, of, 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 of for five centuries. They were uh, outside that debate. But second, uh, uh, the, the, the adoption of these principles and their evolution is not the exclusively or even primarily the work of states, okay? They're a result of civil society pressure. In the case of the Spanish and the, and the Portuguese, it was the, the role of the, 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 the missionary friars, the religious orders, which are, were, if you will, kind of an institutionalization of civil society. Um, in the case of the British, it was the uh, non-conforming religious sects, uh, the Quakers, the Methodists, and then evangelicals within the established Anglican Church that launched a multi-decade debate during the late 18th century when Britain absolutely dominated the slave trade, branding the slave trade as immoral. And that debate culminated in Parliament in 1807, abolishing the trade, which was the source of enormous wealth for the United Kingdom. That was such a, uh, there were petitions signed by over a million people in a society of 10 million people, okay? Uh, it was an enormous effort to, to, to mount that. It was, a, it was a citizen's crusade against the powers the aristocracy that had money from the Caribbean plantations, the city of London that had capital from it, the, the, the shipping and all the rest, okay? It was a citizen's revolt against what was determined to be something manifestly evil. And as a result of that, the British Royal Navy spent the better part of 80 years as its primary mission, the extirpation of the Atlantic slave trade, the United Kingdom spent 2% of its gross national product on the extirpation of the slave trade. 15,000 British sailors died in that campaign. And the slave trade was so profitable right up to the very end that it took the American Civil War and 750,000 deaths to extirpate it in this country. And it took the world's greatest imperial power, indeed, the unchallenged global hegemon, to lend its most powerful instrument, the Royal Navy, and much of its wealth and resources, it's sort of surplus. 2% doesn't sound like very much, but that's actually an enormous amount of a surplus, okay? And the extirpation of this trade, all right? And the same thing, now, the, the, when the United Nations was established, okay, originally there was a conference in a place called Dumbarton Oaks outside Washington, and the, the club of powers got together, Soviet, British, American representatives, and they, drew up a charter for the, a draft charter for the United Nations and and, and basically they they, they created the, the Security Council was the place where the power would reside with five permanent members okay who would always be on the Security Council and who had a veto every one of them had a veto so they had the power of blocking 
this international organization from doing something. And then FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, oh, and we'll have a general assembly so the little countries can get together every year and blow off steam. In other words, this was supposed to be an imperial club. When that treaty went to San Francisco, two things happened. The Latin American republics met privately. You mentioned the Chiles and all the rest. They met privately beforehand, and they came with an agenda to shift this power away from the Security Council and to make an empowered General Assembly. And then also, there were dozens of civil society groups that turned up. The, uh, the B'nai B'rith, the, the, the Jewish Human Rights Organization, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, you know, the original African-American Civil Rights Organization. And they lobbied intensely for the enshrining of human rights in the UN Charter and collectively shifting the character of the UN to make it to transform it from an imperial club into a, the basis of a, a genuine international community. Now, okay, so what has China got for civil society? It is a very powerful dictatorship, which because of the famous firewall, uh, the great firewall of China, are cut off from international debate and discourse and have an extremely efficient and ruthless uh, police apparatus that crushes any kind of dissent. And their, you know, crushing of Uyghur identity, you know, incarcerating a million people in those camps in China to extirpate that ethnic and religious identity is a demonstration of the extraordinary power of this dictatorship to crush civil society. So the, the play between civil society representing principles and ideals and the state representing power and coming together to shape this international order. China's not going to do that, okay? China will not do that. China has this very ruthless communist dictatorship, arguably the most powerful dictatorship in human history. If I may, um, sure. I think that um, that's all very well taken. And the... Um, I yeah, I thought it was real clever. Right. Sorry. The, um, I, I don't mean to sound contentious. Um, the issue that what I see is um, that China is uh, has its own um, the People's Republic of China has its own internal dynamics which are go beyond totalitarian state and um, oppressed brutalized individuals there's uh, in the Soviet Union too you had periods of high to more intense totalitarianism and periods of relative thaw. Um, in China, although the situation now is more severe than it has been in the past in terms of the pressure placed on dissidents, control of the media, there's also a huge Chinese diaspora, movement of Chinese in and out of China. There's um, the reason that the apparatus of control needs to be so robust is precisely because there are so many avenues in which um, discussion, debate, person-to-person um, -person, um, disagreement with uh, the regime uh, are possible. The Chinese People's Republic is not um, entirely outside of the trajectory of um, Western modernity either. The it was the Communist Party that effectively put an end to foot binding, to polygamy, to um, the slavery of um, the peasantry in Tibet under um, lamaseries. Um, there is a uh, element of the human rights tradition that was inherited by the PRC through communism, through Soviet socialism, and it is debased, no question, um, and it is imperfect. One could argue the same for the American civil rights tradition, frankly. Um, and I think that the um, my hope, the I'm not an optimist about the future, and I think many of your most pessimistic projections in the book are are sadly going to be borne out um, in time for us to see them. But 
to the extent that I have hope for mitigating the consequences of things like climate change, it precisely comes from the potential of the PRC to act rationally in its own interests, to um, take into account uh, the human considerations of its own populations, which are an element of the governability of its own state. Um, it's concerned for what other countries, um, for its ability to project authority and not just domination, if if and when it becomes a hegemon, that um, I think the most likely, the most survival course for the world isn't um, a deal that comes out of the United States, but one in which the non-American um, countries of the West are able to negotiate with China to um, make a governable world, which nonetheless includes the legacy of human rights and the international rule of law, which I think is intelligible to even the people, even the Communist Party of China, um, which behaves as it does um, out of significant real threats to its own authority and security. So let me talk about um, what I see as the emerging duality in the Chinese, emerging Chinese world order, such as we can discern it because it's, it's taking shape. Um, and I think it goes to much of what you're saying. Um, uh, on the idea of principle and idea, if you look at Xi Jinping's statements and the statement of Chinese officials about what they're doing with the Belt and Road Initiative, okay, on the one hand, they're very serious about this. Uh, they argue that China has listed 60 million of its own people out of absolute misery and poverty through organization and, and economic development, and indeed they have. There has been a transformation of the, the fabric of life for most people in China. Uh, and what they're arguing is that they're extending that, that uplift, that economic progress to the world's forgotten, not just millions, but you could say the world's forgotten hundreds of millions. Admittedly, during the period of, of the US-led um, international order, uh, the most extreme poverty, uh, people living on less than a dollar a day, that has been grossly reduced, but poverty, people living on less than $5 a day, still remains in, in the hundreds of millions. And, and China is addressing itself. And when you think about when the Cold War came to an end, the US aggressive development program where we were giving fairly heavy foreign aid and had a a bureaucracy that along with the World Bank and the Europeans and all the rest was actually trying to improve state capacity among newly emerging nations, uplift the quality of life. But when the Cold War came to an end and we went to this neoliberal economic model uh, of pure free market economics, we kind of forgot about that. I mean, sure, we kept having a little bit of foreign aid around the margins. Okay. So uh, what China has done with its uh, with its wealth, uh, China was admitted to the World Trade Organization in 2001. Uh, it became very quickly, within 15 years, the workshop of the world. Its uh, trade with the United States went up uh, fivefold, and its foreign exchange went from $200 million in foreign exchange reserves in about 2001 to $4 trillion by 2014. And it's launched this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, which is a $1.2 trillion program extending aid mainly to uh, Eurasia and development program in human history. Uh, at the end of World War II, as we all know, and I discussed this in the book, the U.S. show plan was designed to reconduct a ravage and starving Europe, and that was at the time $13 million dollars which if you correct for inflation is about 100 billion today. Well, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is 12 times that. There's been nothing like it, right? And it has sufficient power to really lay down infrastructure and, and create the capacity to uplift these forgotten hundreds of millions from poverty. Uh, because there's also the mobilization of, of local funds and international funds that, that come along with it. And, and yes, that's very real. Okay, that's the the idealistic side. And by the way, you know, I have, I'm, 
personally rather annoyed at the way the, when the mainstream U.S. press covers the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they call it debt colonialism. They talk about these white elephant projects like ele airports and in countries that aren't being fully used, et cetera. Yeah, they, they, uh, yeah if you spend $1.2 trillion working with developing nations that have limited state capacity, you're going to end corruption. Uh, you're going to have problems. There's going to be some, some graft at the edges. There's no doubt that's going to occur. Uh, but let's look at the main event. This is enormous. This is unprecedented. In human history, there's never been anything close to this, all right? Okay, so that's the, the principle. And that's the heart of Eurasia, too. Um, oh, and, and Africa. And Africa as well, yeah. yeah. I mean, China has, you know, has been China's first serious international aid project. The time that we were, and you know, Railroad. Yeah, the Tanzan Railroad, right? And uh, it, it, you know, uh, it was designed to uh, liberate uh, Zambia and uh, the producing nations of Africa from the stranglehold of having to ship their their products to market through South Africa, which was then apartheid and a, a real force of oppression in Southern Africa. Yeah, and, and uh, um, we regard China, uh, sorry, we regard Africa as kind of a charity case. You know, we have the Gates Foundation helping out and all that. It's, you know, China regards Africa as a serious economic partner and it has for, for um, oh gosh, for, for nearly a half century, right? Um, now, essentially. Yeah, since nineteen since nineteen seventy. Okay, it's actually been fifty years you know, that they've been seriously involved in the economic development of, of of Africa and building close and effective working relations with the liberation movements, which are now the the governments of Africa. Okay, so yes, you know, um, uh, it I, I, that that's that's very serious. Okay, then there's the 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 power side of of, of the duality. All right. By trading, and China is by international human rights organizations regarded as a, a the international rubric of means that China is, is damaging the rights structure that these people, these forgotten hundreds of millions, are going to need as they rise out of misery. And second, uh, uh, China is is propagating coal fired power transnationally. Uh, at, at an extraordinary level, so that they are participating in the pollution of, of, of the atmosphere, the, the global warming, China itself domestically, that, that drive for development, also involved massive coal mining and, uh, and coal-fired electrical power. China now accounts by itself for 30% of all the emissions. And if you add up all the coal-fired plants that China's got online, you know, the world is backing away from coal and China is promoting it. I mean, you know, by themselves, they are probably up to something like 40% of all global greenhouse emissions, right? Now, the cruel irony, as far as China is concerned, um, is that, you know, China, I think, is going to emerge as the global hegemon around about 2030. Um, the... No. Just in time for climate catastrophe. Well, no, 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 no not, not quite. Years, are, yeah, years ahead are, of climate catastrophe. Yeah, they, you know, if you look at the projections, and, and one of the things I, I did in that final chapter in my book is I, I read the climate science. The climate science is, is very predictive, okay? They run things out to the end of the century, and they have various scenarios for whether it's going to be a high damage, a medium damage, or low, and and they're very scientific well, in their I've, calculations. I've, I've seen the I've seen studies which have all of those scenarios, and the low damage ones have, are all blacked out because they're technically possible, but practically unrealizable due to political um, and pra and institutional um, constraints. Right. Okay. So. When you, when you take the mid to upper levels, which is what I do, I, I, I always go and pessimistic on, on when I use the projections. It's entirely and you, correct. Yeah, and you overlay on top of that the trajectory of world history, the fate of empires. What you see is the following, is that significant and gathering disruption after 2030, but that, that doesn't impinge upon you know, the economic forces that are going to make China the great global hegemon. 
Uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, the global accounting firm, has predicted by 2030, the Chinese economy at $38 trillion will be 50%, over 50% larger than the US economy. And since the two powers, the United States and China, spend roughly two and three percent of their gross domestic product on military, well, if China's economy is fifty percent larger than ours, inevitably their military so the transition is inevitable, but it will happen um, shortly before the entire focus of China and the rest of the planet will have to be addressing the reality of climate catastrophe. Well, China is going to is going to get a, a, a double whammy like nobody else. Okay, um, um, wet bulb. The science says wet bulb. Shanghai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing, as I said in the book, is that by 2050, Shanghai surrounding urban area is going to be underwater. Shanghai was dredged from swamp and sea starting in the 15th century. And the scientific calculations are pretty clear that, that the greatest economic engine of Shanghai is going to be heavily damaged. Then there's the North China Plain, Beijing. And it's, if you will, the agriculture and, and industrial heartland of China. It's now home to 400 million people, uh, something like a third of China's population. Uh, the, by 2060, 2070, if not earlier, China, that, that, that North China Plain is going to become one of the least habitable places on, on the planet, arguably the least habitable. They're going to have hundreds of extreme weather events, and they're going to have, it's estimated by a study uh, led by a, a team from MIT, that they're going to have at least five events of 35 degree wet bulb temperature. Now, what does that mean? 35 degree centigrade wet bulb temperature. That's when the heat and humidity come together in a way that the human body is unable to sweat. And a healthy adult at rest, seated in 35 degree wet bulb temperature is dead in six hours, okay? It's just a biological fact. So North China is going to be this disaster area. Shanghai is gonna be the water. China is going, China's era as global hegemon will be over. They will be forced to retreat from the world and use their resources to save their own people. And that's the cruelty of China's rush, its extraordinary rush, economic development and prosperity. The, um, I, I, I want to continue. And I well, have well to yeah, continue. before you continue, but, because uh, Alfred, said he could only stay with us for an hour and it's been an hour and 15 that's, minutes because the conversation got so spicy. Well, okay. Let me finish on one note. Okay. For the <laughs> okay. 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 So <clears throat> where are we in 2050? Uh, U.S. global power is faded. The liberal world order that the United States was the hand and made no, it's going to be battered a bit as the great global hegemon is fade, retreating from the world, turning inward. So where are we? And I think actually that there's a, you know, that things are going to get so bad as, as they, you know, as we've seen the California wildfires, the Australian wildfires, you know, you know, what's interesting is that climate denial has kind of gone away. Nobody's, except for crackpots, are talking about that anymore. Okay. And so we're actually starting to engage the climate crisis with some seriousness, both at home and abroad because of these early disasters. Well, as it gets worse, and it's going to get very bad by 2050, okay, the world is going to, again, uh, not just have conferences and chat about things and have voluntary emission standards. We're going to have to think about really changing the nature of the world order, moving away from kind of the amorphous, you know, sort of a structural system that we have now into a formal world order in which the nations of the world will agree to see limited areas but critical areas of sovereignty to kind of a, a supranational government you know which would probably be the UN and this 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 session of sovereignty and authority would come in three critical areas uh, first uh, just as right now the the international community regards military aggression you know crossing your border invading another country 
as a violation of international law. And, and that regarded as a similar transgression. Uh, and so a nation that is, is, has not converted to renewable energy and then continue to release CO2 in the atmosphere and methane in the atmosphere will be compelled uh, to, by, by the threat of sanctions to switch to renewable energy. Second thing that's gonna have to happen is humanity. The, the, the climate science indicates now that by 2050, this time when China is fading, there will be between 200 million and 1.2 billion climate change refugees uprooted from their precarious perches on battered seashores and floodplains and desert fringe, which are aridifying. And you know, these are people are going to be in motion, not because they, you know, they want a better life. Or something. No, it's simply because they want to survive. They have to move to survive. And, and, you know, we saw what happened between 2016 and, and, and 2018 when there were refugee flows showing up in, in, at the southern border of the European Union and of the United States. That led to Britain's Brexit, the rise of ultranational, angry ultranationalist, anti-immigrant populists in, in Europe, and that's still going on. And then the election of Donald Trump and his build the wall call here in the United States. That, and when you add up the Africans crossing the Mediterranean, the Middle Easterners coming from Turkey to the Greek islands, and the Central Americans coming to the U.S. border. That was just two million people. Just two million people produced that reaction. Well, what happens when it's 200 million? Or maybe getting up to a billion people? You know, it's unimaginable. So, we're going to need an international government to have a rational resettlement of these people a kind of empowered and larger UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And the nations in the temperate zone uh, will have from 35 degrees north latitude to 55 degrees north latitude, which is gonna be the, the habitable part of the earth, are going to have to accept a quota of resettled human beings. Third thing, and this was already talked about at the UN conference in Glasgow a couple months, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, that's the idea of the transfer, the systematic transfer of, of resources technology and capital from the, the prosperous, temperate industrial world to the, the tropical world that is battered by, first of all, the, the loss of agriculture and food security with the rise of hunger. And second Water of all, uh, right, and second of all, a need to have climate change remediation to allow their populations to survive. And so when you add up these three things, what we're going to be moving towards is a a really, for the first time in human history, uh, an empowered global governance. Because the alternative is a is a, a uncontrollable eruption of conflict over water and refugees and horrors beyond imagining. Brutal, primordial conflict over land and people and water and food, you know, in every quarter of the globe. And, 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 and it, will, it, will, it will be an irrational and bloody way of sorting out the, the diminishing resources. And so the world will need a, a rational system for managing this to minimize the suffering and maximize the possibility of cooperation. And so it's, it's kind of, in a way, hopeful that we can change. Well... Thank you. Those Maybe so. Are coming from Dr. Alfred McCoy. He has a new book out. To govern the globe, wherever you're watching this show, there should be links in the description to the book. Thank you again, Al, for coming on and spending some time with us. I definitely appreciate you staying over. Uh, I was watching that clock real hard, and then when the conversation got thick, I was like, oh, well, I'll just shut up and see how long it goes for us. So, Thank you very much for uh, for staying on with us for for about almost ninety minutes. And I want to thank you guys for challenging me because you know I mean, you know not just sitting there and asking you know kind of Dorothy Dick's questions and saying oh Dorothy the next question. I mean you know engaging me and, and forcing me to defend my positions because you know, this is a really it's a much more interesting conversation than it might have been otherwise. You know, Indeed, we brought out my some pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was really, 
That was terrific. I really enjoyed that. You guys pushed me. You, you pushed me. I mean, I thought my book says a lot, and it does actually say a lot. It took me 50 You wrote minutes. 500 some pages of a lot. Yeah, well, it's actually about. Four. Let's let's give the readers a break here, folks. It's <laughs> the morning on the TV. It's only four hundred pages, and it it reads pretty well. It, it, it does read. It, it is it is an easy read. Easy in the sense of it's not a super academic book where it's it's hard to read and hard to follow. It is a very easy read. It's extremely hard, extremely easy to follow. A ton of history uh, of history. Great scholarship in the book. Um, even there's some things that we we may not agree with 100%. Um, I definitely think the book is is very very informative and, and an important read. Yeah. Thank uh, you guys. If, if you if it weren't so valuable, I wouldn't have bothered pushing. But there's you you capture so much essential facts about the condition that we're in that um, the it's. I, I just want to be part of that discussion. And thank you very much for, for coming on. Thank you, guys. This, this was a great experience. Much appreciated. Right. And right. on that note, guys, Kuba and I are going to hurry up into the after hours, and we are out. <laughs> <laughs>